Welcome to the second Darwin and You uh, lectures. Can I just have a show of hands? How many people were here last week? How many people? Oh, well, well over half. How many people are expected to come for all six? Hmm. So I was wondering whether we should have a test at the end. And because it is really a short course, and we could have a little multiple choice test, and we could give you a commemorative uh, plaque that said that you had passed the Darwin and You lecture series course. So think about that on week five, and if you still want to do that, we can do that. Um, so for those who, of you who were here last week, uh, you'll know that the Darwin and You uh, lecture series is part of the Vancouver Evolution Festival, with, which is a year-long series of events. Um, start started now in January to commemorate uh, two anniversaries. Uh, the 200th anniversary of Charles Darwin's birth, and the 150th anniversary of the publication of his most famous book, On the Origin of Species. And the idea uh, behind the Darwin and You uh, series was to try to bring Darwin and his ideas and uh, sort of the overriding uh, idea of evolution by natural selection uh, home to people, because people don't often think about um, these ideas as affecting them. That's why we called it uh, Darwin and You. And um, we were very uh, lucky in that we were able to uh, get sponsorship from uh, both Simon Fraser University and UBC and from the BD Biodiversity Museum and the Biodiversity Research Center, which are both at uh, UBC. So um, this is a collective endeavor. Uh, these are the organizers. My name is Arna Moores, and I teach evolution at Simon Fraser University. Uh, and these are the speakers. So John, Professor John Beatty and Dr. Greg Bull spoke uh, last week. Uh, Greg was in uh, Darwin Drag. And um, Dr. Leticia Aviles will be speaking this week, and then we have a series of four more. Now, the interesting thing was that uh, last week um, we had Darwin, um, the personality. We didn't have uh, the science. We didn't have the science in particular. In fact, it was so bad that somebody asked a scientific question, and uh, it got shunted to the side because we were so interested in Darwin and the history and how he, he how he was thinking. And of course, we were listening um, to Darwin himself. Uh, this week, we are actually going to focus on the discovery. So we're actually going to focus on what Darwin came up with. And we're going to do this using human health um, and disease as our framework. And this uh, picture that's been up for about 10 minutes, it's just a colorized picture of uh, HIV particles. And uh, of course, that's the virus. So these are, each one of these is a virus. And this is the virus that causes AIDS. And of course, AIDS is a disease that kills millions and has killed millions of uh, humans all over the world. It's also an amazing product of evolution by natural selection. And of course, it's one that affects our health. So with the health as our framework, and uh, Dr. Letitia Aviles as our guide, we're going to delve into Darwin's ideas in more detail, which is why I think this is more like a short course. You see, you're going to get the, you got the history, now you're going to get the theory, and then you're going to start applying it to things like human evolution, and et cetera, et cetera, in the weeks to come. Now, Dr. Aviles, uh, Aviles is an associate professor of zoology at the University of British Columbia. Uh, she's originally from uh, Ecuador, and she trained both in Ecuador and at Harvard University in Boston, where um, she wrote her PhD. Now, Dr. Aviles is a world expert in uh, the evolution of social behavior and cooperation, and this is actually a really tricky mystery um, in where individuals that are not necessarily closely related to each other, like parents and children, actually cooperate. And you have to have a very deep understanding of Darwin's ideas to be able to um, understand how this can evolve uh, in all sorts of different uh, contexts. And, um, of course, it would be uh, the source for a, a separate talk that would be uh, equally uh, fascinating. But Dr. Aviles is also an expert in the intersection between human health and evolution. And so she actually teaches an undergraduate course called Darwinian Medicine at UBC. So um, you're probably, and she taught this course at the University of Arizona, where she was before she came to UBC. So you're all consenting adults, and so you now are going to be given a 13-week course in Darwinian medicine in one hour with Dr. Aviles. And I will turn it over to her, and I'll turn this off. So thank you very much, Anna, for the introduction. And thank you, everybody, for being here and for the opportunity to be here to give you a little bit of what I have learned about how Darwinian thinking can help us to understand how better to deal with disease. And um, I'd like to start by just giving you a little bit of an idea of what it is I do other than thinking about these kinds of issues. Uh, and this is just a shot of my website at the University of British Columbia. 
uh, showing just some of the organisms that I work with. And when you don't see me here uh, in Vancouver, you probably may find me somewhere in the jungles of Ecuador, somewhere in South America, studying these critters that look in groups and cooperate. So one of the questions that I'm trying to figure out is why is it that organisms form social groups and help each other in these social groups? And so the question is, how did I come to become interested in human health when my research doesn't seem to be directly related to the issues that I'm going to be talking about today? And the way this happened uh, is when I read this book was, that was published in 1994, co-authored by um, a well-known evolutionary biologist, George Williams, and by a physician. And the two got together to publish this book because they felt that there was a need in medicine to bring into medicine uh, the evolutionary principles so that we can understand better how we are built, how we interact with our pathogens, and that's what's the best way to uh, develop a strategy so that we can cure disease and uh, solve the, some medical issues. And as an evolutionary biologist, I was very excited when this book was published because this was an indication of how directly the field of my study, evolutionary biology, can contribute very directly to our everyday lives. And I decided to participate in this revolution that I think is going under, underway after the publication of this book by teaching undergraduates who might go on to, uh, to medical school uh, evolutionary thinking. And so, again, here's a shot of the course that I teach at the University of British Columbia. And I, I just have to tell you that um, today is actually the third lecture I will be giving. In the morning, I lecture on animal behavior. It's the other course that I teach. In the afternoon, I taught a class in this uh, Darwinian medicine uh, course. And today is my third class. So <laughs> I think I'm still in good shape to do, to do it. So this the, when I started teaching Darwinian medicine back in 1999, it was one of the uh, first courses anywhere in the world taught on this subject. But by now, we have made a lot of progress. I think there are about a couple of dozen courses like this being taught around uh, in universities in North America and Europe. There is also, of course, a website with all sorts of resources uh, on evolution and medicine. There are scientific meetings. There is going to be a meeting in, in April in Washington, D.C. on the topic. But it's still, evolutionary biology is not part of the medical curriculum. And this is something that we hope is going to change because hopefully you're going to see how important evolutionary thinking is going to be to develop better ways to treat disease. So in today's talk, I'm going to um, covering uh, three different topics. In the first one, we are going to see how uh, evolutionary thinking can help us better understand the symptoms that we develop when we become infected by a pathogen. And whether these symptoms are something that may be perhaps helping us, in which case it may not make sense to try to, uh, to suppress these symptoms. In the second part, we're going to be talking about how, um, sorry, how evolution by uh, natural selection happens. And I'm going to do that by giving three different examples of evolution actually happening within our own bodies. The first one is uh, something that you're probably uh, very familiar with. I'm going to be talking about the evolution of antibiotic or drug resistance in general, that the pathogens evolve in response to the treatment that we use to try to eliminate them. But the other two examples you may find perhaps a bit surprising, and these involve evolution uh, happening in our own cells, inside our own bodies, both in the development of the immune de de uh, defense and in the development of cancer. And in the third part, I'm going to be talking about how considering our evolutionary history can help us understand better how we are built and why. So let's get started with the first um, uh, part of the talk. And so I have a question here. When, um, you become infected with, say, the cold or the flu virus, and you develop a fever or you start sneezing or coughing. How many of you tend to ask yourselves, why me? Why, why is it that you are the one who are infected? And the, the other question I'd like to know is how many of you ask why? Why is it that we develop a fever, or animals in general develop a fever when they become infected? Or why do we cough? Why do we sneeze? And this is the kind of question that an evolutionary biologist would ask. 
And the answer to this question is just not merely of academic interest, because what we do about a symptom is going to depend on what the answer to this question is. 